let's do the first.
Anyway, so it's very, but the bottom line is we don't know law. <laughs> that's what we're talking about. And that's the challenge we have is everything's legal, but we really haven't got the law. So, MB, come up and get your five dollars. seeing the patient, so you've got to get your notes done. The legal documents as it's been pounded into us. Um, and you need to have both pertinent positive and negative. So as the physician might tell you um, what they said and then also what they said they didn't say. You know, like, you know, like if you have a headache, you know, do you have a fever? It's good to say they don't have a fever. Do they have nipple rigidity or your neck is sore? Um, uh, do they have change in vision? Because um, if they have those things, then they can be meningitis or um, uh, some sort of brain tumor. So if they don't have that, and that you, and you document you have it, and they turn out to have a brain tumor, you can say, this is why I didn't think of it. Um, anybody know about David and Goliath? So, uh, so David was kind of smaller. Goliath was a real big guy. Um, if you read the Bible very closely, and I do this a little bit of it turns out that um, David, uh, I mean, Goliath had said in the Bible, why do you come at me with sticks? Um, and it turned out that David only had one stick, so he thought it was a cross eye. You know, come to me that I may throw your body to the birds of the air, you know, kind of stuff. And the reason was that is he probably couldn't see very well. Um, he was also a giant at the time, probably 90 feet, which means he probably had a pituitary tumor that caused all of this. So anyway, the reason why he had one. So all of those things are, are stuff you can kind of include from stuff like that. And that's it's kind of what, what you have and what you don't have. And so the medical record becomes very close. Sorry about the bad photo, but um, so this is my example of how I would describe the whole thing over there. And um, that actually was syphilis. I sent them to the ER to get bicillin because I don't have bicillin. It's super expensive. And they didn't even mention anything in the physical about that part of the body. So, and then I talked to the doc later. We just he did it, but they didn't write it down in the note. So, it's kind of an obvious thing. This is the only thing I send you in for. So, so I couldn't pull that chart up. But the, the thought is that it's it's amazing how like just obvious stuff just doesn't get done. So other things for just as being a medical scribe, you need to dress appropriately. Right? Just get yourself some you know, essentially cheap scrubs. Um, and I'd wear a name badge and you can put um, once once you pass the test, and he's gonna be talking about how to get it, you'll be a CMSA. Certified medical scribe apprentice. Um, once you do your 200 hours, then you're a CMSS. So you can say, you know, Joe Smith, comma, CMSS. And that's how you'll sign the chart. Um, I think you should be attentive in the room. Please don't chew gum. Please don't look away. And, you know, yawn really loud. You know, just be part of the whole culture and you want to be focused on it. Um, my opinion is this whole, you know, treat everybody with respect. Anybody over 20, I just call them by their last name. It just says work well for me. They say, don't call me Jarvis, oh, my mom won't let me. You know, just something like that. I just always stick, because if you res if you give them respect, they're really like, under 20, you can call them under 20. That's just an arbitrary thing that's kind of worked for me. But um, I think, you know, once you're 21, you're an adult, and you are paying, you should be treated very respectfully. So I don't think you go wrong by calling them by their last name uh, all the time. Even though they insist that you call them that, um, you just, I think, a little bit of a uh, Formality is actually quite good. Um, so now, um, getting a job as a scribe. So in the, you know, the rubber meets road, you need to come up with your curriculum vitae, which is your scholarly life. And so come up with, you know, the you went, I like when you went to high school, any awards you won in high school, um, then lawyers go to college currently, anything you've done, I worked at McDonald's for two and a half of the best years of my life. Um, you guys know how much I made at McDonald's? I tell you dollar sixty-five an hour. I was worth a dollar sixty five now. Uh, but that's what the minimum wage was. And so you put down, you know, jobs you've had, even like president clubs, anything like that, 
And if you want us to, we're happy to look over your curriculum detail and kind of spruce it up a little bit. You should put down this course. Uh, we're going to give you a certificate of completion so you can put that in there too. Um, and then you should uh, also put in your certificate of the CMSS completion. And then if you can, maybe get someone to write your letter of recommendation, those sorts of things. And then what we typically recommend is um, you need to see a lot of stuff, so I would go look at a lot of stuff. So, um, the ERs love pre-meds, um, especially if you're certified as a scribe, you know, or at least have the apprentices. That puts you up on anyone else that goes there. Most of the time, if you work for um, Scribe America or some of the other ones, they give you like a one-day kind of quickie kind of thing, which is, I think, less than what we get here. Not that this has been that intensive, but they didn't get through all the medical legal stuff and some of the stuff that you've done. And they, aren't, um, they, they do not um, scribe certified. Um, I think wherever you go, maybe look up an urgent care and just talk to them, hey, I finished a scribe course, I need 200 hours. Usually you don't get paid for that 200 hours, you just kind of do it. But once you get it, then you are able to get it. Now some of them may pay you, so you can get paid on that. And I've done it both ways, if I remember the person. So uh, look at, um, your emergency room is, is very good because it's 24 7, 365, so you can get your hours pretty quick. Um, Especially if you're somewhat of a night owl and don't mind working those with bad hours. Um, urgent cares have a lot of hours. And then family medicine usually needs, has a need. At the very least, just go to your student health center at your college and just say, hey, find a nurse practitioner. Can I scribe for you? I mean, this is what everyone wants it if you will do their job. Yes? So, like, for working for like, a hospital, like, some day, like, a physician at Kaiser, so like that, would we be, like, employed through, like, the hospital generally, or just, like, go to the doctors themselves? And, like, yeah, well, I would probably talk. What usually works well, I don't know if you this part. I told you the two rules of medicine, what are the two rules of medicine? Nurses run the universe, nurses like chocolates. So, I would think of going to the emergency room at Kaiser, unless you know somebody who can make the direction. But if you're going cold, I would just say, hey, you know, dress real nice, say, hey, I'm a pre-med student, um, I've passed the course, um, here's my letter of vision. Um, what would you recommend that I do if I want to become a scribe? And then see, so each place is a little different. I, as those of you who've been at Tobacco Valley Hospital, very nice place, but they're very formal. You have to go through all the HR stuff. With someone like myself in private practice, we're not quite as formal. We may, we may still need you to fill out our stuff for our HR, but my HR is going to give it to us to some of the other ones. So that's where you have some options. Um, I do think wherever you're going to school, um, because you, know, you may want to take a little break and we go to the fall, you know, start to do it in the fall and find some places around you. And, um, one of the things I'm willing to do is sort of help you to sort of broker the deal if we can. And I can send some and say, hey, you know, Dr. Smith, you know, so-and-so went to our class, and, uh, you know, if you could, this is what I've done with mine. And, and then you can also look at our website, iemedicalscribe.org, and we're putting the, the courses online and doing some of the other stuff on there. So uh, we want to try to help you to get those, but you sort of have to meet us halfway and find out, like, where you at, what can you do. 200 hours is a lot, but it's really not that much. But once you get that done, now you're certified for the rest of your life. And then the hope is that you can then um, get this experience that will parlay very well for both getting you into medical school, but also letting you uh, really excel in medical school. Um, Tanner's doing amazing in school because he's able to get his notes done. Now he can learn the stuff without learning the stuff and how to chart. And his charts are getting better. They're not there, but he's getting better. The other thing I highly recommend you do once you've sort of gotten the medical scribe is think about getting certified in medical Spanish. You know, the goal is to improve access to quality health care in a culturally sensitive manner. There's 11 million Latinos here in Southern California. You should be able to speak to them. And so you don't need what I call Queen Spanish. You need sort of what I call Tarzan Spanish. You need enough to get through the exam. And, you know, as you do that, you'll get better and better. But what's really nice is to actually have um, the certification of medicalspanish.com certified. So you can go through that. Um, it's um, not over the top expensive. I don't remember exactly how much it is. But it is something that um, you could get. And if you're a medical scribe that's certified, that's, that's certified, that's certified medical scribe, and you're scribe that's certified in medical Spanish, I think you would be uh, a very, very good commodity you know, in terms of that. And again, for medical, it's good. So, this is my mission statement to treat every patient with respect. 
use the best medical practices to improve access to quality health care in a culturally sensitive manner. That's what we're on about. If people ask you why you want to be a doctor, you may want to use parts of this um, because you really want to improve access to quality health care for a medically underserved area. That's what we're about. Um, suggested reading, um, there's just a lot of good ones out there. This whole Ultimate Medical Scribe series is quite good, so I would suggest getting that. Um, this is, uh, there's some other books that we'll sort of uh, let you know about. This is where the doctor, this is that whole thing about trying to be present for the patient with his physicians, but it might be a good one for you guys to look at. Um, I really like this book. This is where the future of medicine is going, uh, and I like the idea, of, there's a lot of stuff that I'm doing with these meetups. I just did a keto, uh, sold out ketogenic meetup, so I'm doing community type of stuff. We have auto responders. We you know, use some of the social media things, as well as um, we're even talking about not only like huge practices like Kaiser the University, but micro practices. We basically just have a laptop and, and you're seeing patients. Um, this is sort of the future of medicine with Eric Topol. We talked about him as genetic cardiologist. Uh, this is the future of medicine. This was his first book, The Creative Destruction of Medicine. Again, I think these are good when you go to interview, you want to know these things. This is by far the best book if you want to learn why doctors are jerks. <laughs> this is the book. It came out when I was in school, and it really talks about um, just why doctors are so cynical. It's not G-rated, but it's actually quite good. Um, and um, they even have the rules of the house of God. And they were supposed to put this in there. But one of the rules is find me a pre-med, essentially, if I find me a pre-med student that only triples my work, I will kiss their feet, because most of the time it's more than that. So just so you know the flavor of that. Um, Atunga Wani is the top, uh, I think, doc. He just started doing the like, insurance work. But he's a, a surgeon that talked about the, us being uh, in, a, um, in a team, uh, so like a pit stop. Uh, this is on the end of life. So especially, you're going to be seeing people die. You're going to be seeing end of life. Sort of difficult conversations. This is an excellent book to kind of get you up to speed on that. Um, and we really try to have it that with several people that we give them things called the pulse, the physician orders for life sustaining treatment. And, and I tell them, you're not dying, but you've got to be ready. And she's like, her husband died, she wants to die. If her heart stops, she doesn't want to be resuscitated. That's fine, I respect that. As long as you have gotten the chance to think it through and the family's gotten up. So that's kind of what we do in family medicine. Um, Tipping Point and all of these are from Malcolm Gladwell, he's one of my favorite authors. So he does a whole thing on the internet a lot. That's sort of where I you know, got that whole thing from. Tipping Point is how things get to be um, a big deal. Um, one of the things he, I sort of found my colleague in there is that there's really smart people, like the brightest lights of the chandelier, and then there's people that connect, kind of like Paul Revere. And Marie, like, if you were Paul Revere, he just like told people the first but he didn't do anything about it. He just told people, got the word out. That's kind of me. I'm not that bright, but I'm a good, I have a lot of little friends in my places, and so I'm unconnected. So that's what I'm trying to do is connect you guys with medicine and vice versa, and then it works out well. So I can talk to the docs for you. I can um, you know, try to help you do that. So this is a book I wrote, and I young want to know care, and the reason I don't have very friends. Um, but the theory is guys don't go to the docs. So this is kind of a small, humorous book to try to get them to come and get uh, evaluated. So we have a second edition of that, then die young, and I'll see one. But like there's gynecologists, I'm actually a guyologist, I take care of guys in the And I just don't want them to die on my watch because I get that young. So, um, but these are the kind of books that I try to have people help me to write because it's a sort of a two part thing we can have people help me with. And so this is that one, rule 11, show me a BMS, a best medical student, that's what they sarcastically call it. Well, they tripled my work and I would kiss his feet, so, or her feet. So it's just one of those things that know that you're a little bit of a pain to the doctor when you start, but you can be a resource and a treasure once you get good. And it's just part of the journey. But but just just understand that this is all part of it. So becoming a better future scrub, um, think of the phrase, can I? Constant and never any improvement. You're not done. You guys are behind, you're always behind. But if you get better, if you can just show improvement, all the people around you will like it. Understand the nurses are in the universe, and nurses like chocolate, so whatever you work somewhere for here, bring the nurses stuff. Like literally, they're all in the world. But if the nurses like you, you'll get them to have an earth. If they don't like you, you'll get nothing. Like, just respect them, 
whatever their name is, call them by their last name, just never sit in their chair. It's just, they love the universe. Um, and then the other is the sort of flip side, and this is more for the high school kids. Uh, but um, understand that if you want to become a medical assistant, it's about $10,000 to take a class. Oh, and, and then it's like 9 to 12 months of taking uh, basically an 8 hour day, you know, 40 hours a week kind of stuff. And so, um, and on the flip side, if you become like you guys are going to be as a, a certified medical scribe, and, um, and you work for a doctor, so um, if you want to, you can work under these folks. And well, this was a course that we do. We actually have this school that I helped start. Whereas you start off as a nothing and we get you to become a medical assistant scribe in about nine months. But um, if you have this and um, you receive on the job training for at least two of the five years, you can then sit for the test. So, what I'm proposing, and you guys, some of you can do it, but um, is we're starting medical scribing in the high school level. We're going to be doing this so they learn medical terminology and then they learn scribing. And then it's an entry level job, so they can start to do scribing. And for a lot of people who don't have a thousand dollars lying around, you guys have no much intuition. After working for a doctor, you probably get paid minimum wage to start and maybe a couple of little uh, bump ups. That after two years you can sit for the test without having taken the formal class. You're still gonna have to like get a book like this and kind of learn from the test. And then you can become a um, certified medical assistant. And then you can also become a so a CMA. A CMA hyphen CMSS. A lot of that community. And then there's jobs everywhere there because you're an MA and a scribe. And then the other flip side I'm trying to do is I have a lot of people who are MAs. I'm trying to do a Scribe boot camp for them so they become MA scribes. So the goal is to move the needle for everybody. Um, so in an MA scope of practice, they can if they take the full body and part of blood, they can do screen and vision. You guys can test your patients. You guys can because you're prescribed, but as you get this, you can do a lot of these kinds of things under the law. So in summary, I appreciate you guys putting up with me, that I truly believe that doctors save lives, but you guys save doctors. And so um, hopefully this has at least Introduce you to the concept of scribing. You can see how it's literally as serious as a heart attack. There's three reasons for the um, chart. It's for patient care, of course. It's for billing, you don't want to work forever for free. But it's medical legal, and I've kind of driven home how this is a very tough document. So hopefully I've given you a little bit of balance. Hopefully I've given you some food for thought for the future. Um, what uh, the, yeah. I'm going to give your spiel. Um, and then one of the things that we uh, didn't really talk about, but in terms of some of the research stuff we're doing, um, we do have the IE Medical Scribe website. You guys do a lot of your uh, sort of community projects. And then somebody else also has allcarewecare.com for diabetes. So you guys are doing some fantastic stuff. That I talked to the city today and even the mayor. They're all very proud and excited of you guys. So you know, keep it up and this is good. So, um, I you guys about the lunch next week. It turns out that this program isn't going to be in it. So if you're in the medical scribe program and not at the field, then you don't have to come. But if you're in the FPL program, you have to come still. Um, also, I, I will show you guys how to log on to your things. I'm emailing them out right now. So if you get extra hundred dollars, we should get an email with your login and your password. And then I'll just show you where to go with that. Any questions? Or
do have one ask if you liked anything I did in my venture on Yelp. <laughs> Some you mentioned that I was going to prompt us to put in a credit card information. Is that, do we put somewhere else here? Yeah, I didn't see specifically. It didn't make me do that. They also told me that they were going to have you self-register. So yesterday when I was trying to like self-register to guide you guys through it, uh, it did the whole like, prompt page $185, so I clicked and it charged me $285. So I, they told me that it was going to be self-registration, but I found out that I'm just going to have to email you guys for a while. So okay. I don't know about the credit card information, but if something comes up with that later, just email me about that or find more information on that. Yeah. Uh, to be clear, for those of us who've already paid, we'll be getting an email shortly, right? Yeah, I just started sending them out like four people should have already got them. So you should get them within the next like, 20 minutes. Ooh, has anybody got it already? Thank you. 